Okay, so I want to finish up uh, chapter five looking at this stone check compactification. And, and so this is actually uh, bringing up to uh, the borders of modern topology. So like people who study uh, point set topology nowadays, they study things like you know, the stone check compactification of the positive integers or the, or the compactification of the reals. Um, and these turn out to be things that no one really can constructively write down what that compactification is. It's kind of like one of the things like the well ordering of the reals. But uh, it turns out to have um, lots of interesting uh, ramifications for like when you talk about things like ring theory, so you're looking at sort of rings of, um, say, rings of functions of, of certain, um, certain uh, objects, or um, kind of like in logic. Uh, you kind of say, so have you heard of the continuum hypothesis? So, like people who are doing stuff with continuum hypothesis, that sort of depends on what, what that kind of object is. But anyway, let's just talk, let's just recall what a compactification is. Um, so, we say a compactification of a space X is a compact Hausdorff space Y. It has x as a subspace such that the closure of x equals y. And um, two compactifications are equivalent if we have a homeomorphism between them um, such that it's the identity on the, the, the thing being um, compactified. And uh, it's very easy to see that a a space has a compactification if and only if it's completely regular. Uh, right, because if it has a compactification, then it's a subspace of a compact Hausdorff space, which is completely regular by a theorem within chapter 32, uh, and hence must be completely regular by another theorem within chapter. So that's uh, straightforward. On the other hand, if X is completely regular, then we know that there is an embedding of X into some uh, product of the unit interval. That was, uh, we did that in chapter 34 when we looked at the Eurison stuff. Um, then the closure of the image in here, right, is a compact castle space, right, because this is compact and so therefore it's closed subspaces um, are compact. That's pretty straightforward. Um, so this is the, the main problem that we're going to be thinking about today. Um, so we have Y is a compactification of X, and there's turns out that there's lots and lots of different y, ways that you can compactify a space. Uh, under what conditions can, uh, if you've got a continuous real value function on X, we want it to extend it to Y? Um, and really, uh, this question turns out to determine uh, everything that you need to know about compactifications, like how much can you compactify? Of course, we can only extend bounded, bounded continuous functions uh, to the compactification, right? Since continuous, continuous functions are bounded on compact spaces, 
So there's no way that we can uh, extend one on X from zero one to some uh, compact space that contains zero one just because it violates boundedness. But the question then is, what are the other um, what are the other kind of criteria that you have to put on to, 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 to make it work, to make it be extendable? And so let's have a look at a couple of examples to see what can go wrong. So a nice example, of course, is the one point compactification of the of zero one, which is just um, S1. Right? So the idea is we take Our unit interval with the endpoints removed, and we can put it in R2 like this. And so the, here is a standard parameterization. We take it to cos 2 pi t cross sine 2 pi t. And so, oh, hang on, it's not that point missing. It's This point. Okay. And so say we have some bounded function on zero one, and we want to extend it now to, to, um, to the unit circle here. So what's going to happen? So if we look at the limit of the function as x goes to, to one, say, it's got to exist. We look at the limit as it goes to zero plus, it's got to exist. But as well, because we're joining up zero and one to a single point, those limits must be equal. And, and so that extension will be well defined and continuous. So to be well defined, the function has to have these limits exist. And for it to be continuous at this point, the limits from the left and right have to be equal. And we can do this kind of the same thing um, on the, uh, for the n-dimensional sphere. So for example, if we look uh, right, instead of the unit square, let's have a look at the unit circle. It's homeomorphic. There's no, there's no problem there. So we're going to do the one com point compactification. So that's going to take it um, to, the, to the two sphere, to the normal sphere. And if we've got a continuous function on here, right, for to be extended then to the, the sphere, right, to all these points here are being mapped, say, to the North Pole, right there, then we've got to have, you know, if we look at all these different ways, like paths, limits, we take a sequence along these things here, um, all those limits have got to exist and they've got to go to the same so they've got to go to the same value on the border here okay well, that's pretty straightforward but we can see it's quite restrictive okay and so that's the thing actually the more points you throw at the compactification the less restrictions you then have on the function to be continuous, right? Because if there's only one point that it's going to, then everything has to match up for, for, to that one point. If you throw more things into the compactification, you know, the limits can still exist, but we, 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 we throw away those equality things. So let's have a look 
Uh, another compactification of zero one, which is, I guess you can call it a two point compactification, where we just consider it inside the closed unit in, uh, uh, in the interval. And all we're doing is we're adding in like. Right, Zero and one. Okay. And so that's a pretty easy one. Well, when is so we've got a function here, a bounded function here. When is it going to be extended to here? Well, all we need is for the limits to exist from the left and from the right. And now they no longer have to be equal. Okay. And in fact, we can do the same thing in n dimensions, right? So the n dimensional cube is the compactification of the open interval zero one to the n. And if we've got a, uh, a continuous function, bound continuous function on the interior of the cube, then we can extend it if and only if, well, all we need then is for the limits of a path to the boundary to exist. And they only have to equal, you know, if the path ends at the same endpoint. And so we see that this allows many more uh, continuous functions. Now the question becomes, can we do better? Can we do, can we have things where we've got a bounded continuous function and the limit doesn't exist? Is there a way to, to have some space in which it will go to some uh, continuous function? And the answer is yes. So let's have a look at our old friend the topology sine curve. And we realize that it's a compactification of that open interval zero one. And so the good way that we realize this is we map zero one to R2 by the map, the typical map X cross sine one on X. And so that definitely continuous and bounded as x lies between zero and one. And then the topology of sine curve is just the closure of that um, image of that. And so what we've done is at one end, we have added a point, right? So we've added in the point one cross sine of one. But over here, we've added in this line segment to the left end. So I now claim that fx equals sine one of x can be extended to the topology sine curve. And I can actually explicitly give you what the what the function is. So if we just let H be the embedding of the topology sine curve into R2, right? So that's all the points x sine one x between zero, not counting zero, but including up to one, including one, and then the line segment which goes from minus no, from zero minus one to zero plus one. And pi two is just projection onto the second uh, coordinate. And then what's our extended function? Well, on this segment here, which is zero y, right? Y between minus one and one, we just let f of x equal y. Where x is this point zero plus y. I think I've screwed up a little bit. 
my notation, but you know what, hopefully you know what I mean. It equals sine one of X on, on our original uh, space, which is homeomorphic to zero one. And we let it equal sine one, right? If it's right at the end point. And I claim that this is a continuous function. Think about it. So what do we got to do? We've got to have a look at F prime inverse of some interval. So let's just think of some interval um, between A minus epsilon and A plus epsilon, right? Where A is somewhere here. And so it's just looking then, so this, that is now a segment between A minus epsilon, A plus epsilon there. So this bit is in it, this bit's in it, this bit's in it. Okay, now the reason why it's continuous is, well, what, what is it on the line segment here? Well, it's just whatever the y value is. So it's just a minus epsilon to a plus epsilon. So it's just this entire open segment here. So it's an intersection of R2 with this open set here. And so that's an open set. And so it gets away with the fact that the limit doesn't exist, right? Because what is the limit as x goes to zero of sine one of x? Well, just it goes to this segment here. So we've solved the problem of the limit not existing. Just kind of neat. Okay. Well. About cosine of one x. That's not going to work, right? Because if we look at the uh, in the image, uh, so this is g g of x equal that. If we look at g inverse of say some interval a minus epsilon a plus epsilon, cosine one of x is what. It's just phase shift by one pi on two, right? So instead of having this nice segment here, you know, it might be here, and then it's here, and then here, it's like all over the place. Um, and so it doesn't match up with anything on the this line interval here. So it's not continuous, but. That's okay. What we can do is now we embed zero one into R three by this x cross sine one x cross cosine one x. Uh, oh, it's it's not a square. Sorry, it's a. Uh, it's kind of like a circle at the end, isn't it? Because Sine squared plus cosine squared has to equal one. So um, in three dimensional space, this curve sort of goes, it's kind of like a spring. And as it goes towards x equals zero, it's going really close to each other, but it still stays on that circle. And so the closure then is going to be that unit circle on the yz plane. Okay, but we've solved our problem because now the exact same thing happens. Now, these functions are extendable as well as all the old usual functions as well. Okay, but that's obviously what you have to do. Anything that you want to be extended, you just include that in your parameterization. Okay. Bit bizarre, right? And so that's the basic idea of the stone check compactor.
application. Take collection of bounded continuous real value functions, the violent x, and then you use them as the component functions to embed x into some rj, where j is your index set for your collection of bounded continuous, continuous real value functions. You take a closure of that, and that's a compactification, right? Because you've embedded the space into some r to the j, and then you just take the, the closure of that. Um, and every function which is in your collection is extendable to that. So going back, so we, we start off by looking at the one point compactification, which is in some sense kind of like the minimal compactification because you just need to throw in one set, one point to do it. And this compactification we get is going to be the maximal compactification. Because obviously, what you want to do is do it for all bounded continuous of uh, bounded continuous function. So, so this is obviously something equivalent to Zorn's lemma, right? Because a maximal object is going to claim exist. And it turns out that. The reason why it's maximal then is that any other compactification is just going to be some quotient then of the external effect. So this is a maximal object and it's got various universal properties. And so here it is. Let X be a completely regular space. There exists a compactification y of x having the property that every bounded continuous map from x to r extends uniquely to a continuous map of the compactification of r. And that's the stone check compactification, and that's called beta x. So this was this was explicitly proven by in two separate papers, one by uh, Marshall Stone, who's an American, and I don't know who the Czech is, and I can't remember what his nationality was. Eastern European. In, that was done in 1937. Uh, but Tikhonov, we've seen Tikhonov's theorem, he actually implicitly used this in his 1930 paper. First. He showed the, that the uh, product topology on arbitrary product of uh, unit intervals is really compact. Um, but he never gets any credit because <laughs> he didn't explicitly state it, but he basically used it in his proof. Um, and the proof is just like. What we what we did in the example, right? So you take the collection of all bounded real value functions on X. Okay, since it's bounded, right, then there has to exist some closed interval, which is the range of uh, which includes the range of F alpha. And so then we can define an embedding of X into this product by just using the, the bounded continuous functions of our um, component functions. And the nice thing is because it's bounded, right, these are closed intervals. So this is a nice compact space. Uh, we don't get any troubles because of that. Right? Tikhonov theorem says that that is compact. X is completely regular. We need that because uh, we need this collection of functions to separate points from closed sets. 
so that we can appeal to theorem 34.2 when we uh, talk about embedding completely regular spaces into um, parts of uh, um, the so that tells us that H is an embedding. Okay, so let Y be the contactification induced by H. So by that, what I mean is Y is the closure of the image of H. So this then gives rise to an embedding capital H from Y to this. Uh, this product of intervals that equals uh, dual H when restricted to our set X. And then exactly the same as that for our example. So if we're given a bounded continuous map that goes from X to R, it must lie in our collection. So that means F has to equal some f beta, or some index beta. And so uh, the desired extension is just phi beta uh, composed with h. And it agrees on x, right? Because if the x is in our space x, then phi beta composed with H acting on X. Well, on X, capital H acts like real H. Right, real H is given by the embedding of all the uh, component functions. The pi beta just picks out the beta index. So that's equal to F beta X, but F beta X equals F of X. And so, Everything fly away, it's like way everything is defined. So it really we've set up the machinery and then this has come basically just by definition and it just works. Um I guess the only thing that really is kind of hard is um, uniqueness. Uh, so really, that's not hard at all, right? Because if we've got a map from a space to to a household space, then at most there can only be one extension from the closure to, to that household space. And I think this is even a problem. Right. Because uh, if you've got two different extensions, then you've got an X in the, in the closure, such so that G of X doesn't equal G pi of X, and now you use house walls and sort of enable it to and then pull them back. So it's, yeah, it's like just a, a contradiction. Um, and and so we only with, with the stone check compactifications we we had that it extends uniquely that extends the functions from x to r. C it actually can be to any compact household space, right? Um, because if, if you've got a compact household space, then you know it's completely regular. So therefore we can embed it into some product of unit, closed unit intervals. We then just use the previous theorem to extend each component. And that, that gives it to us. And so uniqueness then follows uh, if we've got a, a completely regular space, we've got, if we've got two stone check compactifications, then they're equivalent. And this diagram shows you why that's true.
Right, because X has to be contained within the two stern check compactifications. And it's included in each of the stern check compactifications. Um, so by the uniqueness theorem, there exists these F1 and F2s, which are continuous extensions of the identity map on X. But by the level we proved before, there has to be the identity map on Y1, right? Because the identity map is a continuous extension of the identity map on X. The identity map, sorry, of Y is a continuous extension of the identity map of X. Since there's only one extension, they must be the same. So that tells us then if we compose F2 with F1, we get the identity uh, map on Y1. And likewise, the other one is the identity map on Y2. So that means F1 and F2 must be homeomorphisms. So that's that. So if you think about, let's think about something difficult, like the compactification of positive images. What's a one-point compactification of the positive images? Well, it's obviously Z plus. <laughs> Union something. So we, let's call it infinity. And the only thing we have to worry about is what are the open sets. So here, this has got the discrete discrete topology, right? So Right. So what are the compact subspaces of Z plus? Right. Because it has to be finite set because that's the only way that you can get a finite subcover. So the open sets here are infinity union Z plus except the finite many. Actually, the easiest way to think about it is that right, Z plus is homeomorphic. There is this Wasn't that an exercise? It might have been an exercise. And so uh, we can, of course, include that in uh, zero one, closing all zero one. And so the closure of that is then zero, right? And any point containing zero, any open set containing zero has to include all but finitely many numbers of the form one over one over n. Okay, so let's we're not going to go all the way, but let's let's come up with a two-point compactification. So so the way to do it is to look at functions, right? So let's have a look at the function f of z, which is equal to the um, modulo uh, the class of Z mod two, All right? So F of Z equals say zero for even integers and equals one for odd integers. So, so really what we want then right, is we want to put in 
two points, let's call them O and E. Right, such that open sets of O, uh, that's odd integers, um, is O union 2Z plus one, except for finite with many. The open sets of E at E union to Z except for phi at the name. And then by construction, that function is now continuous. So you can see. How can we do it for every, want to do that for every number at the same time? And we still not even touch the surface, right? Because um, there's certain, if you think about all the bounded functions on Z plus, which is the same thing as like bounded sequences on Z plus. So from them, you want you want to <laughs> each one is going to give you a component function, and so you can see how horrible that stone check compactification is. So, so that that's actually why, as I said, <clears throat> that's right at the modern edge of what people are studying to follow. So you can ask, well, how big is it? Um, it has to be at least I uh, zero one to the zero one, right? Because um, no, we did some exercise where we showed that that um, what was it? It was separable, that it had a, a a countable dense subset. All right, this is the this is the space of all functions zero one zero one, and the space of continuous functions is dense in that. The space of polynomial functions is dense in continuous functions. The space of polynomial functions with Rational coefficients is dense in that. So, therefore, there is a, a, a countable dense set in the space. Well, that then tells us that this is the compactification. This is a compactification of Z plus, right? Because we just map Z plus to that countable dense subset, take its closure. This is now a compactification of Z plus, which is kind of bizarre because this thing is just so huge, right? But there it is. And so therefore, this thing must be a quotient of this, of the stone check compactification. So it's just, but it's bigger, it's bigger than that. So that's so it's quite a, kind of because I always think that this is amazing that this has a countable dense sub space, but there's a bigger thing that has a countable dense subspace, and it's probably, in fact, it's the biggest space there is. It's the maximal space that has a countable dense subspace. So again, you can kind of picture why it's so difficult to actually explicitly say what it is. Because you're right at the bounds of modern logic and modern set theory when you talk about questions like that. The stone check, the stone check is actually the largest 
Yeah. By definition, right? Really, because it's the biggest compactification. Is it must have the closure of three parts equals to the whole cell? So Uh, it's a headache inducing state. Uh, I think there's a famous quote about it like it's a three headed monster. That uh, one head is nice if you accept the continuum hypothesis, <laughs> and then it just gets worse from there. Is it going to sign the cardinality? Um, well, that's. Well, the cardinality is at least that. Well, that's the whole thing. That's what the continual hypothesis all, is all about. This cut in is like, well, it's kind of between, uh, between N and L sub N, right? Right. And so, um, so that has something to do with it. So, um, I don't know the whole the whole details of it, but uh, it's um, as I said, it's right on the edge of modern set theory of that. So, what is its actual cardinality would be? An interesting mm -hmm. question. Someone can answer that. Uh, I assume that it's a it's a unknown question. 